Let me ask you a simple question to get us started here. If you're the victim of a crime, what do you do? I'll give you a little hint. Um, so let's say that as you leave the audience today, you go out to your car, your window's smashed of your vehicle, your stereo's gone, so you're going to call the police. police. Very good. Okay, you're at a bar, you walk out with your friend, uh, someone sticks a gun at you and says, give me your wallet. So you give them your wallet and then you call the police. police. Right. You get home, somebody's kicked in your door, your stereo, your TV, everything's missing out of your house, so you call the police. police. Very good. You have that strange email that comes in and says your bank needs to have you reset your password, so you go to the website, and the next time you check your balance, you realize you're down $400 because you've wired money to a place you've never heard of. So you call the bank. bank? <laughs> your friends are all calling you and telling you that they hope you're okay. They've got an email that says you're stranded in London and you need to have them wire you some money. So you call your email provider? Your kids want that new Xbox One for Christmas, but you weren't going to camp out for 48 hours at Walmart. So you try to buy one on eBay and the guy says you have to wire him the money in order to guarantee a Christmas delivery. So you send him $700 but you never get the Xbox. So you call eBay? Why do we call it cyber crime, but we don't call the police? Well, I have a little personal experience with this because uh, we had an incident in our family. We went to the grocery store, we tried to pay for about $100 worth of groceries and it told us the card was declined. I was pretty sure I had more than $100 in the account. We. Uh, check with the bank, we find out someone in San Diego has gone to Walmart three times and spent $1,800 out of our bank account. Well, so we call the police. And the guy says, oh, would you like me to do a police statement so that we can have the bank give you your money back? I'm like, no, we want you to do a police statement so someone will investigate the crime, catch the criminal, and put them in jail. And he laughs at us. He says, that's not how it works. <laughs> And I, I said, well, okay, I'm a criminal justice kind of guy. I know the DA. I'm going to go talk to the district attorney. He says, look, Gary, let's say you could find the person in San Diego. You know what happens next? I, the DA, have to fly them back to Birmingham, put them up a safe place where they reside until such time as we have a trial, feed them. He says, I'll have spent far more than the $1,800 you lost. Call your bank and get the money back. Uh, that's not enough for me. I, I have connections everywhere. So I called someone in San Diego. I managed to get an introduction to the San Diego sheriff. Okay, one of his deputies. But we had, I realized the problem was the plane ticket, right? So he says, we'd be happy to investigate this crime for you, Mr. Warner. Tell you what, just send me an affidavit that says you or your wife will fly to San Diego at your own expense, stay in a hotel for a week, and pay for all your own meals if we catch the criminal, because without a witness in the stand, it's not gonna do us any good. I said, well, that would cost me more than the $1,800 I lost. He said, right, call your bank, get the money back. <laughs> well, I've been trying to connect the dots on these crimes, because how many people think that's the only person that they ever stole $1,800 from? Right, so all the way back in 1992, I was working at a local university, and I started having these problems because we made this mistake. We plugged ourselves into this thing called the internet. And as soon as we did that, we exposed ourselves to hackers and viruses and all sorts of problems. And this was before we had antivirus or firewalls. And so I found that the secret was sharing information. I spent a great deal of my waking hours, and believe me, I have more of them than you do, uh, tracking down these people and helping by sharing what I had learned about these crimes with other people around the internet. I helped them protect themselves, they helped me protect my network. And my boss came to me and he says, Gary, you're spending way too much on this. You're spending all of your time chasing these bad guys. It's not your internet. That was a formative moment for me. I still remember exactly how that conversation went. I said, the hell it's not. <laughs> My people created this internet, computer scientists. We invented this and gave it to the world as a gift. And somebody's out there trying to destroy it by using it to steal your money and your passwords and your secrets and your documents. I'm gonna stand at the end of my internet driveway and protect what's mine, and I hope other people will do the same to protect what's theirs. Well, 
So why doesn't it work? What if we treated physical crime the way we treat cyber crime? What if we told you when you got home and your door was kicked in, it was your fault you're a victim because you didn't have enough locks on your door? It was your fault you were a victim because you didn't have bars on your windows. You should have had a motion detector. If you had an attack dog in the yard, that would be nice. Maybe a brick wall around the perimeter with barbed wire. That's what you needed because it's your fault you were a victim. That's not how we treat physical crime. Why do we do that with cyber crime? Why is it your fault that your antivirus wasn't up to date or you didn't have the most recent security patch? If you're a victim of a cyber crime, someone tells you you should buy a firewall. No, you should buy intrusion detection software. What you really need is intrusion prevention software. Actually, you probably should hire a managed security services company to go through all of your logs for you to make sure that you didn't miss an attack. Why is it your fault if you're a victim of a cyber crime? Somewhere along the way, we decided that market forces should reign and that the industry would tell you what you needed to do to protect yourself from crime. I have a friend in Japan. I just, just, he retweeted me this morning, actually. Hi, Koshiro. Uh, he told me in Japan, they had a service they were rolling out where you could call a government phone number and they'd send someone to your house to remove the virus for you. And I said, that's, that's ridiculous. How could you do that? And he said to me very seriously, he said, isn't it the government's job to protect you from cybercrime? Isn't it the government's job to protect its citizens? And I said, not in the United States. <laughs> not with cybercrime. I heard a story from Richard Clark. He, I was at the DARPA Cyber Colloquium in 2011, and he said, what if in the Cold War, President Kennedy had said, hey, General Electric and General Motors and Ford, I need you to all come to the White House to have a little meeting. And he said, I've got something to tell you. The Russians may come after us. So here's what we're gonna do. I'll take care of defending the government facilities, but you guys might wanna look into some anti-aircraft and maybe some fighter planes because you're on your own. But that's exactly what we've done with cybercrime. The government's actually built this wall around their network and they have trusted internet connection points. These drawbridges where they put an Einstein three billion dollar sensor there to make sure that nothing bad comes into the castle. The problem with that is we're all on the outside of the castle. The government has said, we should use these industry solutions to protect ourselves, but they're all building a billion dollar wall that we don't have access to. Uh, now, I, I have lots of friends in the legislatures, both in the state and, and national level, and one nice thing about legislators, they've never heard a problem that the solution wasn't another law. <laughs> and so let me share one of these laws with you in Alabama we now have a law that says it's a class C felony to access a computer without authorization for the purpose of devising or executing any scheme or artifice to defraud or obtain property. And if you steal at least $5,000 or $2,500, that's a class C felony. That means you could go to jail for up to 20 years. Now, is that an Alabama thing? No, that's a federal thing. The federal government calls it Title 18, Section 1030, fraud with regard to a computer. And if you commit that crime and steal at least $5,000, you're going to go to jail for 10 years. If you do it to more than 10 computers, you get an extra two years for aggravated identity theft. Sounds pretty good. I bet the criminals are scared of that. <laughs> I, think, I think she's holding a class C felony right there in her hands. She was so afraid of this law as she and her friends stole $220 million from tens of thousands of Americans that she posted that picture on her Facebook wall. Now, we measure crime. The government has this rule that the government has shared with, have you guys reading ahead? The, the, the government has laws that say that we should have every municipality, every county, every state report up to the federal government, to the Department of Justice, every time a crime happens. So they measure aggravated assault and rape and burglary and murder and all of these physical crimes. And you know what? The measurements are showing that every category of crime is falling. But what we don't measure, there isn't even a category, not a box that you can check as you do your police report that says to report a cyber crime. And as this teller is pointing out to his criminal, you know you can do this just as easily online. 
Is physical crime falling because cybercrime is going up? But nobody's counting. We don't even have the terminology or the technology to count. The estimates of how many dollars are lost to cybercrime range from $52 billion in the United States per year to a trillion dollars. That's a pretty wide range. Now, so we have to rely on industry and researchers to come up with some of these statistics. Semantics says that there are 18 new victims of cybercrime per second. Think about that. 18, 36, 54, 72, 90, 108. We just had 100 new victims of cybercrime. How many of you, them do you think called the police? Um, Consumer Reports has a report that they survey people about various kinds of victimization. They said that in 2012, we had 9 million Americans who fell victim to phishing, those fake bank websites. And 58 million had malware that they had to spend time and money to remove from their computer. In fact, just the cost of removing the computer viruses was $4 billion. That's not how much money was stolen, that was the cost to respond to it. 19 million Americans had money taken off their credit cards without their authorization. 10 million had money taken from other forms of accounts. And despite all of the technology we can offer, 43% of Americans still say they're experiencing heavy volumes of spam. So what do we do about it? I've chosen to do quite a bit about it, I think. I went to my boss at the oil and gas company where I was the IT director. They've been very generous loaning me out to the FBI to help with cases and to help with the InfraGuard program. And I said, I'm going to resign. He said, what's wrong? And I said, I've got to go make my own FBI agents. <laughs> and he said, I don't understand. I said, I'm going to go find a university that will let me teach people how to fight cybercrime the right way. And he says, where are you going to go? I said, well, I'll start with my alma mater at UAB. I went to UAB's administration and I said, I'd like to do this. I laid out my plan. They said, well, what? I don't understand the objective. I said, well, I'm going to get 100 new FBI agents that I trained. <laughs> and well, how's that working? Well, we have students in the FBI and in the CIA and the NSA. We have students working at Microsoft and PayPal. We have students at Visa and Bank of America and Regents Bank. We've got students all over the world who are fighting cybercrime the way I do. But what about you? Isn't it your internet too? What can you do? Well, remember the $1,800 that I had missing. What if you had $400 missing, but you didn't call the police? And the same criminal took $400 from you and from you, and in fact, from 10,000 people. Eventually, that adds up to money. Well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? The DHS has this thing that says, if you see something, say something. Well, say something. Call the police. And if they don't respond the way you think they should, let your elected officials know. Tell your congressmen and your senators, tell your governor, your DA, your attorney general, I'd like you to change the way we fight cybercrime. And in the meantime, send that evidence to me. We'll help you collect the dots. Thank you.